praise Jesus. Now let's um, join me for a time of confession. Trusting in God's grace, let us confess. God of love and power, we listen to the stories of miracles and doubt that these things can happen today. We look at the waves of misfortune, distress, misery, distrust, and anger, and wonder how we can still those waves. We feel the pressure of power and fear flooding into our lives, threatening to drown us and wonder where you are. Forgive us for the littlest of our faith. Forgive us for our doubts. Help us to place out trust in you, Lord Jesus. Help us to fix our eyes on you and on the ministries to which you have called us. For we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now hear this assurance. Having heard your confession, I have a word from Christ himself, announcing to you the entire forgiveness of all of your sins. All that is required, Christ has already accomplished for you on the cross for your sake. There is nothing left for you to do. You are free in Christ, a free heir of Christ's kingdom, and he is faithful to his promises. He cannot lie to you. He loves you. You are his forever. Peace be with you. Amen. So good. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Surely goodness and mercy will follow us all the days of our life. And we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Those are not my words. Those are yours. We might have lived this week struggling to believe in the goodness of God. But he promises. He's our good, good shepherd who leads us in the paths of righteousness for his namesake. He walks through with us through the valley of the shadow of the worst thing, death, so that we don't have to fear any evil. He leads us in green pastures and quiet waters. In the midst of our chaos, maybe what you're just saying, God, is what we view as chaos is quiet waters where we have you. Help us to believe that. In Christ's name, amen. You may be seated. We all long for freedom. Freedom from anxiety. We kind of preached too long in the first service and it was messed up, so we're going to get the shortened version of it. We sing of the goodness of God. And we long for freedom. We long to be free from anxiety and fear in the midst of our lives, which seem less than certain. My son Noah was here this week, and Noah's a different bird, my son. <laughs> he, like, knows the lyrics to Hamilton. <laughs> um, he kind of has appreciation for musicals, and, you know, this week he was playing uh, from Les Miserables the song I've Dreamed a Dream and I just do you know I was sitting in the theater the 
the weekend that um, Les Miserables, the musical, came out, I don't know if that was 10 years ago now. I don't know, maybe longer than that. Um, and I heard Anne Hathaway sing I Dreamed a Dream. I'm kidding. This is opening weekend. And she plays the character who's just, her dreams have been shattered. And she basically dies at the end of the song of I Dreamed a Dream. And I was sitting there in the theater with Lynn, and when she sang the song, I mean, I'm kidding. This is opening weekend of Les Miserables. She sang that song, and in the midst of it, in the context, and I almost downloaded it for us today, I dreamed a dream of a God who is loving, and I dreamed a dream that there's forgiveness. She sang that song, and I actually said to Lynn, opening weekend, Anne Hathaway just won an Oscar. And you know what? She did for that. How did I know that? I mean, first of all, I don't know that I knew that at the time. I just said it. But what was, what was it while she was singing as tears were coming down my eyes? Is because when she sung it, she sung the cry of every freaking human heart that's lived life. And then life hasn't been what we would have written or what we would have wrote. And these things come at us. I was at a wedding um, on Friday night. And, you know, when you go to weddings and everything is, <laughs> they're committing their love to each other. You, you've been married for like 30, we've been married 29 years. And you're thinking like, do they know what they're getting into? <laughs> you know, is it, is it, is it, uh, do they quite comprehend everything? And no, they don't. And that's okay. It's okay. But I was reflecting, and I said something to Lynn um, afterwards that, that, like, when Lynn went to our wedding, <sighs> she just got a, a husband that she didn't even know she would have 29 years later. All of my insecurities, all of whatever Lynn promised on that day, and maybe what Lynn hoped for, it's been like long shattered. Thanks, Chris. And yet, just, whatever has been shattered for Lynn has been a reminder to her of a faithful, faithful God. A faithful God who has promised freedom and promised himself And that is our text for today. I don't know that, honestly, my story, Lynn's story, is very different from all of our stories. We've longed for life, some of you, been married multiple times. You thought this was it, and you thought this was it, and you thought that was it. And in the midst of it, the one constant thing when it wasn't it is Jesus. We live life as if we feel we are in a heaven's heavy storm, at least in North American culture. I don't know if this is true throughout the world. Do you know that America is more medicated than we've ever been? 
And if you're on medication this morning, I'm not demeaning that at all. At all. Life is hard. I believe God actually gave us medicine, <laughs> honestly. Thank you for clapping. <laughs> he gave us medication. But that medication is a reminder that we live life in the storm. Or you can go back to the confession. What do we confess? That the waves overwhelm us. Anxiety and fear and doubt. They wash over us. The waves of our life, the waves of a health diagnosis, the waves of friends that have turned against you, the waves of your failure as a parent or as a spouse, expectations. The Lord's always redeeming those things. Yeah, Jesus does. He's the Redeemer. And He comes. And as we wade through those things, for me, I want to blame other people. When struggles happen in my life or they happen in the church, I want to blame other people. And Jesus is just trying to say, I'm in the boat. And I'm in the boat with you. And Jesus is always redeeming us. Yeah, Jeremy. And I'm grateful for that. He can do anything with anybody. Because he's promised. My buddy was actually talking to my friend Steve who's sitting back there and I'm sorry Steve I'm going to embarrass you but <laughs> you may not know who Steve is but uh, um, the Lord has just done a lot of work in his life you know Steve is actually going to stand as a minister this weekend and marry someone that's proof that there's a God right Steve <laughs> Amen. I think that's the hope we have people coming in, Amy, from the back, so if you want to go greet them, um, that would be great. Um, we may wonder that. Steve may have wondered that along his journey. You may have wondered that. We have waves of misfortune, and distress, misery and distress and anger, and we wonder. We just want, we want the chaos stilled in our lives. Now you can go to the text, um, which is Matthew, or Mark, um, which is there. Go to the next slide. <sighs> I love this. So last week, if you were here, it's okay if you weren't. But last week you were here, you heard Jesus tell like this bizarre story, um, this completely bizarre story a parable is what we call them, about this farmer who likes sow seed. Um, it doesn't seem like the farmer really knew what he was doing. It says he sowed the seed. This is Mark 4, same chapter. He sowed the seed, and then he went to sleep. And lo and behold, while he was sleeping, it started to sprout, and it started to grow. And it says the farmer woke up, and things are growing, and he doesn't know how it happened. And then it said, this is what the kingdom of God is like. Like a bizarre farmer who doesn't really know what he's doing, but he just shares or he spreads the seed and something happens. And this is what the kingdom of God is like. And lo and behold, on the same day, on the same day where Jesus told a parable or a story about a sleeping farmer and said, this is what the kingdom of God is like, on the very same day, guess what we have? 
On that same day when evening came, Jesus said to them, let's go across to the other side. And they took him in the boat as he was, and other boats came along, and a great massive storm of wind came up. Waves poured into the boat, threatening to to sink it, and Jesus was in the stern, head on a pillow doing what? (laughs) Sleeping. It's not the first time in this chapter we find someone sleeping. We've just heard that sleeping has something to do with the kingdom of God. And how it grows and how it produces and how it operates. And now, just a few verses later, who do we find sleeping? Jesus. And who doesn't like the fact that Jesus is sleeping? The disciples. <laughs> you can get, we're going to hang on this slide. And Jesus was in the stern, head on a pillow. This is kind of an incredible story. Like waves are pouring into the boat, and he's on the stern, and you wonder, like, is his cushion or pillow, is it wet? <laughs> like, is he, like, it's wet. Like, like, the waves are pouring into the boat, and Jesus is sleeping. Like, can't you, can't you, like, Wake up to that? I don't know. That, that reminded me of a time when our firstborn, Christina, was born. Like, so this was New Year's Eve, so she might have been three months old. Linda and I went to a New Year's Eve party. This was when we were still in the other side of the state, Melbourne. And this New Year's, people, New Year's Eve party was like rocking and loud. Um, and um, music is blaring. Um, it is going on. We have a three-month-old. I should have been three months at the time. And um, we had one of those, like, pack-and-play cribs, you know, that you had. And, and um, so we brought Christina because we're trying to still do things that parents without kids don't do. <laughs> but she was three months old. So we brought her. There was a bedroom and um, she fell asleep, so we got her to sleep in the bedroom, and around midnight, the music is blaring, it's really, really loud, people are really, really loud, and I'm thinking, Christina, there's no way she's like sleeping through this, and I poke my head in the room, and there she is, just sleeping away, kind of like Jesus, like the waves are coming in. They're pouring in, and he's asleep. And everybody around is losing their mind. They're perishing. And yet Jesus is sleeping. You know, these disciples, you would assume, were in their element, right? They're fishermen. I mean, even when Jesus said, and I mean, there's so much here. They went out at night. Night in Scripture is usually when peril happens. And, but you would think that they, as fishermen, would think, well, we got this. Well, we've been out in the Sea of Galilee lots of times. The original language certainly carries with the idea like suddenly a storm came up. Sometimes, you know, like we can see things coming, but you know, most of the life, most of our lives, we don't know what hit us, <laughs> frankly. We have no idea what hit us. We don't even know what's going to hit us by the end of the day, right? We don't. We don't know if there's going to be a phone call. We don't know about all of that. And yet here are the disciples. Here's the people of God in a boat. And they don't know what hit them. In an environment that was their territory, that they were trained for, that they should know what to do. And Jesus is asleep in the boat. And it says they roused him. And we find out, this this. Honestly, I've noticed this more and more in Scripture. I told you last week that one of the beautiful things about being in the gospel every week, I I would say going on to 10 to 12 years now, is you get to know Jesus. You just get to know him. 
that's part of my upbringing is true. You know, when they were saying when I was a kid and they were trying to get me to read the Bible, what would they say to me? If you want to know who God is, then you need to spend time in his word. And the more time you spend in his word, you will get to know him. Well, in all of these years, as I have probably more than often than not, not consistently, spent time in the Gospels, I've just gotten to know him. There is a clue that there's something wrong from the first words that the disciples utter to Jesus. And it is a word that reveals a lot about us too, and maybe even why we're here today, or you are here today in your storm and your chaos. What is the first word they utter to Jesus? Teacher. This dude has performed miracles. He's healed with her hands. And in their moment of crisis, what do they want? An education. They want an education. That's us. Maybe you are here in your peril this morning. Maybe you are here and you have come here in your chaos this morning and you think there's this God talker up here and what do you want the God talker to do? You want him to be a teacher so that you can apply what you learn and maybe it will alleviate your chaos. We'll find by the end, he ain't calling him teacher anymore. <laughs> I just, I can contend going through the Gospels, every time the disciples called Jesus teacher, 100% of the time they've missed him and they have missed him completely. Because we live in a world, we live in a society, even when things happen. You know what happens when we have a worldwide event or a uh, some event that's more crisis oriented. Do you know what happens when you turn on your TV and we've been through this moment of crisis? Guess what you'll watch? Doesn't matter which news channel you watch at all. There will be somebody on the news channel and they'll be talking and below their name they will have their credentials. Which then validates them to talk about what we can do to eliminate this event from happening again. What we can do to eliminate the storm from happening again. All we need is experts. All we need is a teacher. They had seen miracles, but they were living life by explanations. There's nothing that logic can't do to handle this situation. There isn't thing that education and logic won't do that will give us more control over the storm. They call them teacher. And then they said this, which was an accusation. Do you not care? And we can get all over the disciples for asking this question. Listen, Jesus, if you went back, you don't need to go back to the first slide. Jesus told them, let's get in the boat to go to the other side. We did what you said, Jesus. We followed and we trusted you. And the waves are pouring into the boat. You can imagine the scene as they're pouring to the boat. Maybe they get buckets and they're trying to get water out of the boats. I doubt this was like a massive yacht, okay? <laughs> Not in that time. They're pouring water out of the boat. I mean, imagine if you were in the situation. There's a group of you in the situation, maybe 12. I don't know how many people were in this boat. And you're working and water is pouring in. You think you got it under control and you're doing it and you're finally getting out to the point. Say you were on the boat. Say you were on the boat and you are doing everything you can to save yourself from perishing. Water is coming into the boat. And you're doing everything possible to save yourself from the situation. And there's a dude sleeping in the boat. What would you be your conclusion? He doesn't care. And 
looking for a logical explanation. That's actually similarities to the book of Jonah here because the boats were overwhelming that boat. And Jonah came up with a solution, right? It was kind of specific driven. He just gave him an education and says, well, maybe you just need to, you, you know, God's mad at me. So just throw me overboard and let me perish. God had different plans, but the only explanation, listen, I know we don't like to think about things this way, <laughs> but if Jesus is sleeping in this boat and he is sound asleep in the midst of the storm, I just didn't picture this picture of Jesus. <laughs> you have a drooling Messiah. <laughs> Does he care? Does he care? Does your Savior care in your storm and in your boat? I would contend that there isn't a person in this room who has struggled and or is struggling with something. Have you tried to rouse Jesus with your prayers? Have you tried to rouse Jesus with your prayers? I think most of us have. And when the response has not happened, you know what we wonder? Do you not care, Jesus, about my family? Do you not care about my marriage? Do you not care about my health? Do you not care about my finances? Do you not care about my reputation? Because it's all, it's all boiling down. What are you doing, God? Well, Jesus is roused. And he awakes. You can go to the next slide, James. Awake now. Jesus finally speaks. Does he say anything to the disciples when he first speaks? No. And he doesn't just speak. The word there is he rebukes, which is a reserved for forces typically that are contrary to the work of a Messiah. Jesus speaks and he rebukes the wind. Why does the wind deserve rebuke? I mean, God, the creator of the skies and the seas and the weather is in God rebuking God here. There's a sentence sense what he is, but is God not rebuking God here? Why does he rebuke the wind? What did the wind do? Why does the wind deserve rebuke? The wind deserves rebuke because the wind is attacking the disciples' faith. It's undoing their faith. And anything that undoes the disciples' faith or yours and I's faith is worthy of rebuke. What's undoing your faith? What's sending you for a spin into your chaos. Sometimes I view my only role up here is to rebuke what is undoing your faith. And I will tell you this 100% of the time, you know what's undoing your faith? You know what's causing you to doubt God? It's Jesus plus something. That something is undoing your faith. 
The epistle passage this year, this week is in Corinthians. And Paul is saying he is dying, he's afflicted, he's being torn apart. Because Paul is trying to speak to people who are actually super religious. And he is trying to speak rebuke to the things that are undoing and causing division among the people of God. What's trying to take your faith away? You thought you did all the right things. This relationship was going to work out perfect, and it's not. Jesus rebukes that. He rebukes the idea that you thought your marriage would save you and make your life great. Jesus rebukes the idea that your perfect children would make your life great. Sometimes I think the enterprise of the church is we come screaming into each other's lives. And as we come screaming into each other's lives about you should have and you could have and you would have, the very things that we are trying to scream at is where God is actually rebuking the person so that all they have left is him. This was the point in the first service where someone walked out, a visitor. When I said, when I counsel, I'm not interested in making your faith better. I mean, your marriage better. I'm interested. I'm interested in whatever God is doing in your life. And if a broken marriage is what God uses to believe that Jesus plus nothing equals everything, then I believe that's what God wants. And we can't stomach that. Whew. Holy moly, pastor. You can't say those things in church. My friend um, who I've quoted before, David Zoll, actually wrote things you can't say in church. That would be one of them. <laughs> God's interested in you and you and you and you. I don't know what he's doing. He speaks, and you know what he says? And this is where I spent too long. I, I won't say a lot. He actually uses the idea, so faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. In some of the translations, it says, peace, be still. That original word is more than peace. Peace certainly happens. I don't think that's a terrible word to use. But you know what he says to the wind? Be silent. The wind is coming, and the disciples are hearing something about the wind. And Jesus says, I need that voice out of my, my people's ears. Be silent. I want it muzzled. That's what be still means. I want it muzzled. I want it silent and I want it muzzled because it's destroying the faith in the people I came to save. And what comes to destroy the faith, I want silent and I want it muzzled. I want it stopped. I don't want that in my disciples' ears. I want my words in their ears, which are peace. And my goodness and mercy that will follow you. Do you know your shepherd's voice? Do you hear your shepherd's voice? And the wind ran out of breath. Does God care for you? That's the oldest lie in the book. Satan's a one-trick pony. Do you know what Satan used in the garden way back in Genesis 1 and 2? Does God really care about you? He's hiding some from you. You need to pursue a different path. You can't trust him. Because he doesn't have your best interest in mind. In our anxiety and distress, we believe that God is not for us. Jesus stands up and rebukes the wind to remind us that God is for us. We... We buy into a world where we want explanations, we want education, 
You know why we spend most of our time working is because we believe the law is not working the way we want it to work. We did this and we did this. We got this cosmic Santa. You put the right thing in and you get the right thing out. Have you ever put money in a vending machine and it didn't work? <laughs> like now they have those arms that push the thing out and it's supposed to drop and then you, you grab it. Sometimes you put the money in and it just got sideways a little bit and it pushes it and it's just about to fall, but it doesn't about to fall. But we put our money in, right? We deserve it back. You know what we do with the mini machine? I've done it. Have you ever done this? Yes, Kathy. We <laughs> but I put my money in. I want to get it. I want to get that out. It's like right there. I can see it. I can taste it. I can taste it. And it's not falling, but I put my money in. I deserve that Reese cup. <laughs> That's what we do with God, right? Put it in, cut out. We start to shake God. God, I put the money in. I mean, he is just a cosmic Santa. You know, and I do this every once in a while. I try to sing. But it is just Santa, right? You better watch out. You better not pout. You better not cry. I'm telling you why. Santa Claus is coming to town. He sees you when you're sleeping. He knows when you're awake. He knows when you've been bad or good. So be good for goodness sake. That's our view of God. Don't lie. It is. Santa's no different than God. But that's not who God is. And we get freeful. We think that God does not have us. We want peace with God, but we don't know what he's up to. And Jesus says, why are you so afraid? And you think, well, Jesus, I'll tell you why I'm being afraid. Because my boat's completely swamped right now. <laughs> That's why I'm afraid. Life is fragile. I've tried to stop the storm. I've tried to go to church. I've tried to do, I've tried to do everything you say, and the boat continues to be swamped. I've done everything you said, and and yet I've lost a child. I've um, I've lost my relationships. And Jesus says, you know, why, why? Why? I want you to be curious. It's actually not a confidence when he says, "Where is your faith?" He's asking us to be curious about our own hearts. Why don't you have any confidence in me? I mean. And one thing we know is the miracles haven't created any faith in the disciples. They've seen many miracles and they still don't have any faith because they don't know if the next one's coming. Jesus, though, was not absent in the middle of the story. He was with them. Faith, ultimately, is trusting that God knows what he's doing, even if it is not what we want him to do. Who is he? And I'll end with this. Sometimes I just don't know if we, well, first of all, we don't know everything Jesus ever did in Scripture. Jesus is funny enough and humorous enough. Like, did Jesus have, like, daily devotions with his disciples? I don't know. They're so common today. I'd like to think he did. There's also something that tells me, like, if he was having daily devotions with his disciples, here's what he would have done. Before he would have got on the boat and told them to go, hey, let's have uh, daily devotions. I want to, all they had was the Old Testament. So all they had was Torah and the books of the Old Testament. They had the song book of the Old Testament. It's all they had. Jesus says, hey, before we go to the other side, we're going to take some time. And I'm going to open up Torah and I'm going to talk to you about God. And they would have known that. Jesus was a teacher. So he taught people, literally, uh, from Old Testament and from those things. So he says, you know what? <laughs> I got a passage for us today. 
before we get in the boat, I want us to turn to the songbook of the Old Testament. Um, I just want to talk about that before we get in the boat. So he's having his daily devotions. He gathers his 12 around, or if there were more, and he teaches them. So here's today's passage. I'm going to talk to you from Psalm chapter 107, and you can go to that slide. Um, now, it's the, there's a gap, and then that's that slide. This is from Psalm 107. Jesus' daily devotions on the same day. This is unbelievable to me to think that he could even do this. They mounted up to the heaven. This is just from Psalm 127, 26. They mounted up. The whole psalm is great, but this is what it is. They mounted up to the heavens, and they went down to the depths. In their courage, or in their peril, their courage melted away. Sounds like our story, doesn't it? In the peril, all of their courage melted away. They reeled and they staggered like drunkards, and they were at their wit's end. This is written centuries earlier. Oh, yeah, man. Couldn't you see the disciples at their complete wit's end here? They're completely at their wit's end. Then, while they were at their wit's end, they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he brought them out of their distress. Oh, yes, Jesus God of the Old Testament, he's done this. He's brought them out of your distress. Um, I didn't get to the next slide. You, you, we, we didn't finish the psalm there. Um, um, it's really beautiful. It's just the whole point of the whole thing. Centuries earlier, they staggered. They're at their wits end. They have lost all courage in their peril. And he just decides on this day to give him this psalm. And he said, he stilled the storm to a whisper. The waves of the sea were hushed. They were glad when it grew calm. And Yahweh guided them to their desired haven. Let them give thanks to Yahweh for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for humanity. Let them exalt Yahweh in the assembly of the people and praise him, the council of the elders. Now let's get in the boat and go across the sea. Just pretend that he did that that very day, just a few hours before. And then guess what? They're in peril. Their courage is gone. They are at wit's end. And in their distress, they go to just this teacher that they think is sleeping at the stern of the thing and say, don't you care about it? That teacher who they think is just a teacher stands up and says, hush and be silent. And the waves are seized and, the, and everything grew calm. They then says at the end of our gospel passage that they were in awe. They were terrified because all of a sudden their daily devotions, they're saying, oh my God. God, Yahweh's in the boat. He's in the boat. He's in the boat. Yahweh is in the boat with us. Yahweh is in the boat with you. He's in the boat with you, Mark Klingbell, this week. Whatever the doctors say, he's in the boat. He's in the boat, Nikki Nero, with you. He's in the boat. He's in the boat. Oh, my God. The God of Psalm 107 is in the boat with us. And his name is Messiah, Christ the Lord. I don't know where you are in your boat. I do know that Yahweh, Jesus, God, Christ Almighty, is in it with you. And even a sleeping 
Savior is enough for this pastor's lack of faith. That's what this story tells us. Even a sleeping Savior is enough. Because he's king and he's God and he loves you and he loves me. Let's have the table. If you're helping serve, please come. We'd love for you to partake and know that this God who is for you went to a cross and he bled and died and on his last night, he gave this table and he gave us actually a command and says, you do this till I come again. We like to think we're faithful and obedient because we're going to do this till he comes again. And on that night, he broke bread and he said, this is my body broken for you. And on that night, he lifted up a cup and said, this cup is the blood of my covenant. It is shed for the forgiveness of your sins. It is shed for you. So we would love for you to come. We'd love for you to partake. We would love to, for you to know that the chaos and the storm in your life does not have the final word over you. Your Savior does. God Almighty does. Yahweh does. And he's for you. He's not against you. And so we will sing of the goodness of God wherever you are in the boat and wherever the storm is in your life. So come in the midst of your storm and meet the one who is not asleep right now, but he's standing and reigning at the right hand of the Father. And you hear that he is for you in the midst of your storm. So come. We have an amazing God who's in the boat with you, whether you think he is or not, and whether you think he cares or not. And he is speaking. And that sets us free. It sets us free to celebrate. It sets us free to celebrate life. I love life. I love who we are. I love that we're a family. And if you're visiting, too, um, we'd love for you to have some cake, to Go in peace. Amen.